I'm Dr. Richard Heuser. Um, I'm joined here today by Dr. John Laird and Dr. Hiroshi Yokoi. Um, we're going to talk about uh, fem femoral popliteal lesions. And I think before we get started, first of all, um, Dr. Laird, uh, what do you think the overall feeling in terms of treating femoral popliteal lesions um, is going on in the field today in terms of uh, where do you think our uh, challenges are right now? Well, I think it's always been a very difficult space. You know, the SFA is probably the most heavily diseased vessel in the body. Uh, we routinely encounter long occlusions, 20, 30 centimeter occlusions, diffuse disease, uh, and uh, it's a vascular bed that uh, is uh, just challenging. Uh, there's a lot of uh, me mechanical forces at play, uh, torsions, twisting, stretching, compression of the vessel. So it's an area where endovascular therapies have always uh, been challenged. The results with balloon angioplasty historically have been very poor. Uh, for many years, uh, stents were tried and uh, were unsuccessful with some of the first generation stents. And uh, now uh, we have some reason to be optimistic with drug-eluting technologies. We have drug-coated balloons, which everybody is really excited about, and, and drug-eluting stents, which I think uh, may have a, a role to play here in this, uh, this territory. Professor Yokoi, yep. have you had any experience with either the drug-eluting balloon or drug-eluting stents in your country? Yes, in Japan, the drug-eluting uh, balloon is not available. That in this year, the clinical trial started just only above the knee. Below the knee, not, not, not yet, uh, no experience of the clinical trial. The, and the drug eluting stand, as you know, Zilba PTX, uh, the last year uh, from uh, June, uh, so July, available in Japan. So the, before the United States, in Japan, <laughs> available. That's a big news, yeah. Well, um, as we've referred a couple times at this meeting, it's a sad state of affairs in the United States, the limitation in technology. Um, but hopefully it'll get better both in our country and in your country. So let's go over a few slides that go over a few key points in treating femoral popliteal lesions. Um, there's still a controversy about anthrectomy. Definitive uh, trial um, looked at the use of the Fox Hollow device. The drug-eluting balloon studies have included multiple studies, the Thunder, Fempat, Levant, Pacifier, Debate SFA, looked at some task C, task D lesion and looked at instant restenosis also. But we still don't have the answer for drug eluding balloons whether uh, for instant restenosis that's the way to go. Personally, it certainly is suggestive that we'd want to use that therapy as opposed to another expensive therapy like a drug eluding stent. In terms of the drug eluding stents on the other hand, we do have a lot of data. In fact, the Zilver PTX trial and registry have shown definitively in high-risk lesions as well as really fairly non-complex lesions, uh, certainly it's better than a bare metal stent. The question is, where can we utilize it in other subsets like instant restenosis? And also, we'll talk about the STOP ISR clinical trials, how long and to whom. Paraprocedure outcomes. In terms of success rate in claudication and critical limb ischemia, it's always a little bit different. It's usually not as good and efficacious in patients with critical limb ischemia, and procedure success in these higher risk patients is always a little bit lower compared to uh, claudicants. Yeah, this is the uh, definitive LE uh, data, which, uh, <clears throat> although it's not you know randomized comparative data, at least for the first time, it's reasonably good quality data uh, looking at atherectomy in the uh, SFA and, uh, and infrapopliteal arteries. And so this was a, a trial that uh, included 800 patients and over, over a, basically about 1,000 lesions uh, treated with uh, excisional atherectomy with either the, the uh, Silverhawk device or the Turbohawk uh, device. And as you mentioned, uh, results a little bit uh, worse in CLI, not unexpectedly, but overall uh, technical success and procedural success with this device is quite good. 
when you look at um, uh, Definitive LE, one of the things that was a game changer in terms of the Fox Hollow device, it was the first atherectomy device that was efficient, meaning uh, when you remove the plaque, it wasn't just, oh, look at all this plaque we've removed. We get definitive, as, as the title of the study, uh, results in that most of these procedures can be done standalone. I guess the question I have for you now, Dr. Laird, how much uh, Fox Hollow do you use at this time, or is it been supplanted with some of the other uh, maybe sexy, more sexy or newer technologies such as CSI or uh, pathway or laser? Well, I, I've never been a really heavy user of atherectomy, but I will say that since the definitive LE data became uh, public, I've, I've started using it a little bit more and been thinking about it a little bit more. Prior to that, I used uh, excisional atherectomy mostly for niche applications, uh, common femoral artery disease, popliteal artery disease, you know, the so-called non-stent zones, and sometimes for in-stent restenosis. But I have started using it a little bit more uh, for just standard uh, SFA lesions, potentially cases where you'd like to avoid a stent. That I think remains to be the, the main advantage of this technology is you can get a good uh, angiographic result, a good hemodynamic result without having to use a stent. Well, I think you're exactly right about its application in the common femoral artery as well as at the bifurcation. I don't think there's anything that can um, more definitively give you an outcome that you, uh, is, is, is good and doesn't result in compromise of the deep femoral uh, artery. Uh, Professor Yokoi, have you had much experience with the uh, Fox Hollow device yet in Japan, or is it something not utilized that much? Uh, not yet the available in Japan, so I have no experience of the atherectomy devices. But the, my question to the Dr. John Lea, the in Japan, the, the, a lot of the calcified region in patient exists. So the, how do you, does the, this the device the, perform the severe calcified region? The yeah. yeah, that's really the question. And with the, uh, the newest version of the device, the TurboHawk, a calcium cutting device, it is much more effective cutting calcified plaque than previous devices, but it still grinds the plaque to a certain extent. Uh, there's a strong uh, uh, potential for distal embolization, so you always have to have uh, embolic protection in place when you use the calcium cutting device. And uh, so uh, there's other options for really calcified lesions, including the the orbital atherectomy device from uh, CSI, and they have a newer version of the technology, the Stealth platform, which is in many ways similar to a ro rotoblader, a rotational atherectomy. And uh, the Pathway uh, jet stream device also is reportedly uh, somewhat effective for calcified lesions, although I have no personal experience with that device. I don't know if you have any experience with it, uh, Rich? Yeah, I've had more experience with calcific lesions with the um, CSI orbital atherectomy device, and I think it, it performs very well. The problem with pathway and the orbital atherectomy device, you don't get the sort of lumen that you can with the Fox Hollow device. And uh, again, what's interesting about the definitive LE study is that the primary endpoints as are listed. And again, uh, as John mentioned, this is a fairly large study. Uh, 743 patients, primary endpoint, primary patency uh, was uh, very good. Secondary uh, endpoint uh, at 12 months was also fairly high in the high 70s, even in diabetics, um, and overall the results were pretty good. The yeah, prime, that's, uh, yeah. that's one of the unique features of the study is that uh, patency at 12 months was equivalent between diabetics and non-diabetics, which is seems to be unique to this technology because in every other study uh, outcomes are worse with uh, with diabetic patients. One of the big uh, problems we have not just in the United States but I would uh, venture to say in the Asian Pacific area as we've seen more and more in diabetics uh, is the problem with critical limb ischemia in that uh, when these patients come in usually they end up with some sort of amputation and the primary endpoint, freedom from unplanned amputation of the target limb at 12, at 12 months, this isn't at 30 days, this is at 12 months, an outstanding result at 95% in over 200 patients. Again, 
Even though this is registry and data collection without randomization, this is an outstanding uh, study and I think it can be commended. And, and uh, one of the issues we've had with a lot of the peripheral devices is that there's not a lot of science involved. And even though this wasn't a randomized trial, I think the fact that they have these sort of numbers in a carefully controlled, do you know, was this, was this a core lab or was this, this was a, was a core, core lab? lab adjudicated, yeah. There was both a duplex uh, lab as well as an angiographic core lab. Okay. The only qualifying point uh, to what you said about the CLI uh, group here was that they were relatively short lesions, short lesions in the okay. CLI patient population. You know, mean lesion length as we see here yeah. uh, in the seven centimeter range overall for the CLI uh, yeah. patients. So it's not, uh, yeah. not the typical case that I see where you have a 20 centimeter occlusion of a tibial artery or a very diffuse long segment disease, which are, I know are many of the cases that uh, Dr. Yokoi is treating. So still, still remarkably good though, limb salvage. You can't say anything against the limb salvage rate of 95%. That's yeah, superb. And you, and you wonder, and we'll see when it's in publication, um, what patients were excluded and why they were excluded. Uh, if the lesion length was uh, limited, um, was it limited, do you know? Is it less than 10 centimeters? The lesion length, uh, my recollection, was uh, up to uh, 20 centimeters or so. Wow. So there was the potential to have fairly complex lesions huh. in the in the, uh, the study, but as with many of these studies, when you have maximum lesion length in that range, 15 to 20 centimeters, yeah. you end up with relatively short lesions at the end of the day. Right, right. So, uh, in terms of the patency and claudicants, uh, clearly different between patients with an occlusion compared to stenosis as we'd expect. Um, the patency infrapopliteal uh, was remarkable at 90%. Uh, that's pretty good. Are you a little surprised with those favorable numbers? Yeah, I am surprised. It's and in part due probably to the lesion length again. Uh, yeah. Lesions are a little shorter here, but uh, it's uh, really quite good. And I must admit, uh, when I think of a critical limb ischemia, infrapopliteal vessels, the, um, quite frankly, the Fox Aldo device is not the first thing I grab in terms of a infrapopliteal lesion. And maybe that's a mistake looking at these numbers. 78% uh, patency in infrapopliteal uh, critical limbs. Um, of course, the thing that's different about the critical limb ischemics is we just want a vessel going to the foot. We just want to get a single vessel at least going down with good flow. But uh, these results are, are pretty remarkable. So um, let's turn over to the discussion about the drug eluting balloons. Um, I don't know about you, John, but when I think about an infrapopliteal lesion, uh, the work we do on an everyday basis, whether we use standard balloon angioplasty below the knee, which I tend to do, mm -hmm. um, we can get a good result, um, but the restenosis rate is high. Now, that doesn't necessarily apply the fact that the patients do badly, badly. In fact, if you get a good single vessel going down to that ulcer, you'll heal the ulcer and the patient won't have to have the amputation or the amputation is limited. Um, but it's almost, it's always been my felt, thought that if we had a drug eluting balloon that could literally reduce restenosis rate a little bit, I'd probably use it all the time. Uh, this meta-analysis of a number of the drug eluting uh, balloon uh, trials. Now, the total patient number is not really, really high, but on the other hand, this meta-analysis uh, in drug in target lesion revascularization certainly shows that compared to a plain old balloon angioplasty, the uh, drug eluting balloon was more efficacious in terms of target lesion revascularization, and the binary restenosis also uh, was, was lower. Again, um, these numbers are pretty small. What, what, what do you think about this, John? Well, I think there's a consistent effect amongst these uh, trials, and in some cases, different uh, companies or uh, balloons. I think the uh, unifying theme is that it's the same drug. It's paclitaxel, which is well suited for this application. It's uh, generally the same dose, although not all of the balloons have the same dose. But most have the three microgram per millimeter square dose, with the exception of the, the Lutonix uh, device, which is a uh, two milligram or, or uh, for microgram per millimeter squared dose. 
So same drug, most of the same um, concentration or dose, and fairly consistent uh, response in, in these different uh, randomized trials. So even though they're small numbers, they all seem to kind of fall out uh, with very similar, similar results. I think the caveat is, though, that there are still relatively short lesions in all right. of these trials. Right. We're talking about mean lesion lengths in the 7 to 8 to 9 centimeter range, so we don't have a good sense for whether these uh, drug-coated balloons will work as well in the 10, 15, 20 centimeter long uh, SFA lesions. Which are where we really need these, <laughs> yeah. these drugs. Yeah. So what... what um, what platform is going to be used in the in the trials in Japan? Do you know? Is it the Medtronic or is it the yes? The now with the Bard company and the Medtronic oh, company okay. try to the SFA trial the, in Japan in this year. Okay. Um, John, do you think that's going to be the uh, Bard's is going to be the first on the market in the United States? You think it's going to be actually pretty close. Um, you know, Bard uh, slash Lutonic sort of had a head start. Uh, they started the randomized trial, the Levant II trial in the U.S., uh, before Medtronic, and they finished enrollment before Medtronic. Uh, but the FDA mandated that they would have to do a, uh, uh, a, a registry of a larger number of patients to confirm some of the safety issues related to this product. So they're now actively enrolling in this, uh, this registry whereas uh, Medtronic had actually completed the registry up front. So they finished their randomized trial later, but they've already finished the registry. So at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if they get approved around the same time in the U.S. Well, I can, I can say as a cath lab director and you as a uh, cardiology uh, department director at the university uh, in California, I would love it if we had a, a couple at the same time yeah. because uh, quite frankly, it's all about price, and it's always about pricing and utilization of equipment. If we can reduce utilization uh, and we can have two competitive products out at the same time, there's more than enough room for that. I agree. If we look at late lumen loss, I think it's the same story. Late lumen loss uh, continues to show in all of these studies in a meta-analysis that the uh, drug-eluting balloon uh, performed admirably and better than the uh, non-drug-eluting uh, non -drug eluting balloon. And, uh, of course, uh, it's something that I, I must admit as a clinician, it's, to me it's irrelevant. Obviously, I wouldn't think you'd get any death with these uh, therapies. On the other hand, if the device performs better, you want to make sure that there's no risk involved, and certainly there was none. And I think that's important to look at, although for a study like this, I'm not sure that isn't, is necessary for meta-analysis, but I'm glad they looked at that. So, let's talk about the debate SFA trial. First of all, this is uh, utilization. Now, this was a fairly small trial, but I presume, was this drug-eluting balloon with a bare metal stent bailout, or was this drug-eluting balloon and bare metal stent mandated? compared to regular balloon angioplasty and bare metal stent. Are you, do this you know, John? This is a provisional stenting after okay. a failure of, a, okay. of the drug looting balloon or of the regular balloon. And my, I believe this is the Medtronic Impact SFA uh, technology. Yeah, I think that there's two things. Number one, um, I don't know about you uh, other operators, but from my standpoint, I still don't automatically put a uh, stent in all the femoral lesions, if I get a good stent-like result with a balloon angioplasty, particularly if it's uh, a short lesion, or in some cases when there's a long lesion and I get a really good result except in the main vessel where I'll put a single drug eluding, or excuse me, single self-expanding stent. I don't automatic stent all femoral lesions because I don't think they're all alike. Am I, are you the same? Yeah, I think it's, a, as you say, it's a very heterogeneous uh, uh, lesion subset. Every patient's different. Uh, clinical presentation's different. Uh, heavily calcified versus non-calcified. It's unlikely that we're going to get a great result in an extremely calcified lesion with balloon alone. So many times we end up with stentine. But I, I think there has been and continues to be this leave nothing behind sort of mantra uh, 
trying to avoid stents in this uh, vascular bed if you can if you can help it. Yeah, particularly when you get a little bit lower near the adductor canal. Um, we have, and I know you have had good experience with the IDEV stent in that position, but I still, when I get to the popliteal or I get the adductor canal, I really don't want a stent if I don't have to. Is that your opinion, Dr. Yokai, also? Do you like to not stent in that area? Yes, the non-stenting zone at the proximal SFA osteo region, that's also the sometimes it covered the deep femoral, uh, I'm sorry, uh, deep fem uh, femoral sure. artery. Right. At, that, at that point, at, uh, this uh, device and then the, uh, and also the atherectomy device, the, I hope. So the atherectomy device plus drug coating balloon, can be <laughs> Exactly. Uh, synergy uh, yeah. strategy. That's no, you're exactly that. right. I, yeah. And I was thinking the same thing when you, we talked about the common femoral lesion. We could talk about at that bifurcation. Wouldn't it be nice? You do a great result with atherectomy and you go in with a drug eluding balloon. Of course, we're stepping up and we're going on to the next stage, but that's what we need as clinicians yeah. to be, have that availability. You and agree, we'll get, John? And, yeah, and we'll get some data sometime this year from uh, the definitive AR study. Right which is a study looking at uh, atherectomy with a Silverhawk device followed by drug-coated balloon uh, compared to drug-coated balloon alone. And there's also uh, a trial looking at laser plus drug-coated balloon versus uh, drug-coated balloon alone. So uh, I think that's, uh, that may be the holy grail. If you can remove some of the plaque, get a really outstanding you know, angiographic and hemodynamic result and then deliver a drug that's going to prevent restenosis. Uh, that could be, you know, that could be the home run if if it's not too expensive and if it's not too much trouble that people are not going to want to, you know, do the procedure. I know Dr. Zeller has shown that in uh, one of his slides. Uh, basically, you're prepping that um, endothelial tissue so that you can get in there and definitively be able to deliver the drug after you've removed the plaque. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's amazing when we think about atherectomy, uh, first in the coronaries beginning in the uh, really mid 80s, now we're finally maybe getting its application and it may not only be efficacious in the uh, uh, peripheral vessels, but maybe this is something that needs to be revisited again in the coronaries perhaps with a either um, absorbing uh, bioabsorbable stents with drug coating or uh, drug eluting balloons in the coronaries. So the one-year outcome both in terms of restenosis as, 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 as well as TLR was a significant improvement in patients with uh, drug eluting balloon and, and uh, plus or minus bare metal stenting compared to a regular balloon and uh, uh, bare metal stenting if, if necessary. Um, going over to the uh, Zilver PTX versus uh, standard care, so this was the Zilver uh, PTX drug eluting stent versus optimal angioplasty in a bare Zilver. Um, not only do we have uh, short term follow up, but uh, three year follow up. I, I must admit, when I look at this, it just, it just appalls me how, how long it took for us to get approval in the United States and how we're still limited in the uh, Zilver uh, PTX. Um, your utilization, John, you've been working on it for a number of years or With shorter the than the Zilver that. PTX? Yes. Yeah, we just recently uh, got uh, Zilver PTX at our institution. You know, the companies had to have a very slow uh, rollout of the product uh, uh, because they didn't want to build up a huge inventory of product while they're waiting for the FDA approval. Yeah. because they were afraid they were going to end up with a bunch of expired product on the shelves and waste a lot of money. So they've been ramping up ever since FDA approval. So it's been a sort of a slow rollout in the U.S. So we just uh, fairly recently started doing cases, and I saved up a few of really <laughs> my most difficult uh, cases for uh, Zilver PTX, including treatment of long SFA instant restenosis or long segment disease. And... Uh, it's uh, maybe not the optimal way to go is to take the new technology and immediately throw it into the hardest cases, but it's just natural to want to do it that way because you have people you really want to try and help. Well, it makes sense when you have a three-year reduction of restenosis of 42% uh, in patients and, I, and the patency is this high. Uh, freedom from TLR also uh, was significantly improved. So it, I think there's a lot of excitement, at least in the United States, about this. 
um, and I think we'll remain to see uh, how often it's utilized. Um, the uh, bare metal stent versus the uh, uh, drug eluting stent in a provisional way, also there was a three year uh, restenosis uh, reduction. So if we look at de novo lesions compared with a number of, it's not, not exactly fair, these are not the same trials, but uh, they looked at the uh, Zilver compared to uh, uh, some other uh, stents and they showed uh, a performance that was much better. So uh, this is an intriguing study looking at Platel, an old drug that uh, comparing aspirin to aspirin and salastazole after one year of stenting. Um, is this a drug you use a whole lot of, uh, John? I would say not a whole lot. I think most of the uh the uh, data with regards to salostazole and restenosis prevention is from, from Asia, from Japan, and yes, from yes, Korea. From Japan. Yes. And, um, and, I, and, and I think, you know, we have used it for many years for claudication for symptom relief, uh, but we haven't used it as, as much, I think, in the U.S. for prevention of restenosis. And, but this is a data which might uh, change people's uh, viewpoint. So maybe I don't know. Yeah. Maybe Dr. Yes. So this this trial the uh, the uh, the make the in Japan, and then this trial the uh, enrollment patient the Lazarus class two from the from two to four two and three and four uh, mm -hmm. class three patient the sixty percent of the class three patient, and mm -hmm. the randomized to the shirostazole versus non shirostazole all patient uh, uh, added the aspirin and uh, uh, ticlopidine. Ticlopidine stopped uh, one month. And then aspirin plus siloxazole versus siloxazole. Uh, uh, aspirin alone, I'm sorry. That. Mm -hmm. And then uh, primary endpoint, the follow up, one year angiography. All case angiography wow. done. That's yeah. outstanding. And then the follow up angiography rated the 84%, wow. e extremely high. Yeah. So the independent collaboratory tree measurement uh, the, by QVA, and then the significant restenosis reduction in siloxazole arm. That, uh, very exciting data. And the stent, the all stent is a smart stent. Yeah. All is a bare metal smart stent. So consistent uh, yeah. stent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then, it, it, yeah. if, if you show this with your new drug eluting balloon or drug eluting stent, <laughs> you'd be the biggest sales. I mean, yeah. this, is, this is a salesman right yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, we need to start using this drug more, John. Yeah, you know, actually when I first saw this uh, data, I immediately had a couple of patients with <laughs> recurrent instant restenosis that I put them on salastazol. Yeah, so. Uh, anything that would exactly. help a little bit for those patients to uh, be worth the, worth the trouble. And the region range is 120, and diabetes patients, including 55%, that's a real world data. Yeah. Recently accepted the circulation, circulation so recently published. Yeah. Uh, one month, year, uh, within one month, year. <laughs> one, one month, yeah. So, if we can summarize, uh, I think we've looked at the optimal strategy for SFA disease, atherectomy, drug eluting balloons, drug eluting stents, maybe drug eluting balloons with bare metal stents, and maybe atherectomy and uh, drug eluting balloon, and then also the post stenting maintenance. I think the Platel story is just opening in the United States, the rest around the world. The Japanese knew about it a long time ago and been using it. I think this study certainly is intriguing and makes us think that maybe we need to be using this drug, this old time drug, a lot more. I'd like to thank my uh, associates here. This was a lot of fun and I appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Cut. There we go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Good job, guys. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hoyzer. Yeah. Thanks.